All right, so this evening I preach a sermon called Seeking a Sign. Seeking a Sign, and this is something that it's a very simple uh, topic that I want to focus on today, and I think it's something that kind of infects Christianity in general, and it's something that, that a lot of people, I think, allow too much into their lives. And what I mean by when I say seeking a sign, a lot of people today have a tendency to ascribe a lot, a great deal of importance, sometimes the very regular things that happen in their life. And I think of phrases like people say, well, everything happens for a reason, right? Uh, that's one of the most common things. Now, the statement is true. Everything does happen for a reason. But usually the people who are making that type of a statement are ascribing it to some higher power and almost to a level of just like mysticism about every little thing that happens. Now, if we were Calvinist, we could probably say that every single thing that happens would just be a result of divine intervention of God just planning and making everything the way that they are. But in reality, God in general, I think, is very hands-off. Now, God can help lead and direct our paths and guide us along the way and help us to make good decisions. And God definitely is capable of intervening. And we know that God will at times intervene. And there are things that are miracles that can take place. But overall, there are many instances, well, the reason why things happen is because it's just normal, because... Uh, you know, that's what happens. I mean, the reason why I get hungry without having enough food is because my body needs food. I mean, there's no extra special reason to the exact moment my belly starts to tell me that I'm not, you know, I'm starting to feel hungry other than just, that's just the way things are, right? Everything, every uh, action is going to have a reaction. Every, everything has a cause behind it. But unfortunately, it's easy to get caught up in a way of thinking where you start to ascribe much more meaning behind normal events that, that tend to happen. Um, oftentimes, and part of the confusion I think comes from different stories and teachings in scripture where you'll find, for example, when bad things happen to people, God turns them around to be good. God can take situations and lead people down paths and end up doing good, but that doesn't alleviate or negate anything about, well, the person who did that originally was wicked and they did bad. Um, it wasn't God that made those things happen. So, like, I think of the example of Joseph, you know, where, where um, his brethren hated him and sold him to be a slave into Egypt. God didn't, I don't believe that God forced that to happen, but God was using those events. See, God has foreknowledge. He knew what's going to happen, and he's able to put, to, to help Joseph along, get into certain positions to be used of God. But at the same time, other people just did things out of their own wicked heart. And, you know, there's things that happen that, that don't... Um, you know, God, if God wants to supernaturally intervene, he can make things happen however he wants. But we got to be careful in, in ascribing more importance to regular things than we need to or looking too deep into normal occurrences. So we started off in Isaiah 47. Look down your Bibles here, verse number 12. Because what I like about this passage is it just combines a lot of different things that people get caught, in, caught up in that are evil, that are wicked, that are condemned in Scripture. So if you look down at verse number 12, the Bible says, Stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to, to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. And what he brings up here, you know, enchantments, sorceries, 
um, astrologers, stargazers, monthly prognosticators. These are all names of various types of people who are involved in like witchcraft, people involved in the astrology. You think of horoscopes, you think of all of this stuff where, where people are trying to ascribe this mystical reason and give you occult type knowledge. And these are the people who are going to be looking into, you know, the, the palm reading and, and everything else that the Bible condemns, but try to ascribe extra meanings beyond and give you this extra knowledge and counsel that really just isn't there anyways. I mean, people who are looking to the stars, for their, for their guidance and wisdom. And oh, well, you know why this happened is because this star's over here and that star's over there and see everything lined up and there's this vortex over here that um, you know everything kind of played together and this actually happened the way it is exactly supposed to. And, and you can look at some of the most benign things as, and just ascribe it different purposes and different meanings. And we got to be careful about that because this is how, you know, partially how the Pentecostal church works. They like that mysticism. They like the, the, the show and, and the unknown and trying to get people wrapped up in things that, that seem mystical and magical and, and have no real explanation, although they do, right? They, the, the, the stuff that goes on in Pentecostal church has a very good explanation. One, when the people are rolling down on the floor or whatever, they're either demon-possessed or they're faking it. Yeah, amen. And these, these mega preachers that, that have all these healings going on and stuff, they're paid actors. Like, there's an explanation for it. They're trying to deceive you into thinking that these people are actually being healed, but they never go into the hospitals and heal people. They never go into, you know, just out in the open and actually heal people. They bring people in to a stadium and that's, you know, somehow maybe that's the only place they get the power of God or whatever, or the holy water that they want to sell you for a hundred dollars a bottle. You know, if you just send in your money in, in five easy payments of 1999, you know, that's the only way you're going to, you're going to get that power too. But they like to use that type of stuff. And it's this, this magical element and part of it can be appealing. You know, people want to believe in, in these things that to have this extra power or whatever, or to know extra things or to have the horoscope. Oh, wow, what's going to happen to me tomorrow? I want to get some insight into that. There's, an, there's a natural appeal to that, but the Bible says that those things are wicked. And we need to be careful to allowing that type of thinking just into our own um, doctrine or into our own life when it comes to how we view the way that God works in our life. Now, there are signs given in Scripture. So, what, like, real specifically, just when I talk about seeking a sign, oftentimes I think people are just looking for a sign of, well, this is what I should be doing because this happened and this happened, which are good things, so I'm just going to take this path. Or this is showing me that this is the right path to take. Or like, you know, let's say you know, I'm looking for a job, right? Well, I think this is the right job to take because when I walked in the door, the, the sun came out from a cloud and there was this big rainbow that like, you know, lit the way and, and everything just looked perfect, right? And I know it sounds kind of silly and maybe this example is, I'm just making it up, but you know what I'm talking about. Think about, there's, there's other times, and I think a lot of people are, can be guilty of this from time to time, just in general, of starting to ascribe more reasons of just like, well, I think that, you know, God's trying to tell me something here through these different things, when in reality, you're probably just reading more into it. When we see signs in the Bible, there were signs in the Bible. And we actually just had, we we're just dealing with Gideon asking for a sign from God that what he was speaking to, that, that he was really the one that was going to go and save Israel and everything else. He wanted to confirm what he's already heard from the Lord. But, um, and I'll just read for you from Ju Judges chapter 6. We went over this a little bit on that Wednesday night. But um, in Judges 6, 16, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. So this is God's word. This is the word of the Lord on the Gideon. He's telling him what he's going to do. And 
the word of the Lord is what we should be basing all of our decisions on, all, you know, all of our truth on how we live based on the word of the Lord, not on some feeling, not on some sign. But see, at this time in the Old Testament, Gideon wants to try the spirits, right? We're commanded to try the spirits. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. See, the, the job of a prophet is supposed to help guide and to help give you instruction and help make the word of the Lord plain and clear and to help you know the path and the will of the Lord. But there are many false prophets out there that are going to deceive you and get you down the wrong path. So it's our job to be able to try the spirits. Well, when I look at Gideon, I think that's literally what he's trying to do is to try the spirit. Like, God, is this, are you really talking? Is this really coming from you, Lord? Do you want me to? Well, in order to prove this, can you? And that's why he follows up when the Lord tells him this, that you are going to destroy the Midian, Midianites. He says, and he said unto him, if now I found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. He's like, I just want to know that this is you, Lord, and not some other false prophet. That, that was his way, I believe, of just wanting to confirm that this is the word of the Lord. And it's actually a pretty unique instance when it comes to signs and someone actually asking for a sign. Because another thing that we, we have a tendency to want to do in general is ask God, like, when we have important decisions, God, can you just show me a sign that I'm on the right path? Can you show me a sign that this is the right thing to do? Can you give me a sign? We actually don't really find examples of that in Scripture, of people just asking God to give us, you know, to give them a sign to do this or to do that or to make their decision. We don't see examples of that in Scripture. This is probably the closest thing and is a pretty unique event in, even in that capacity. We do also have one other time in Scripture where Hezekiah is told that he's going to be healed. And Hezekiah asks for a sign to confirm that he will be healed. But again, this is just another example of confirmation of what's already spoken by the Lord. It's to confirm that this truly is going to happen based on what was already been told by God. Uh, 2 Kings 28 says, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? And this is where he makes time basically go back, you know, 10 degrees. He's saying, well, it's a light thing to go forward 10 degrees. I want you to go back. And it was a miracle that was performed, and it was a sign, and God did that sign. Now, these are, there's very few examples of people asking for the signs. As I said, most of the signs that you see in the Bible are actually just foretold signs of God saying, this is how it's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. These are the signs of what's going to happen to already confirm it and to already prove that it's coming from the Lord. But I think in just about all these instances, I'm trying to think if there's another example of someone asking for a sign other than just to prove that it's the word of the Lord. Gideon was proving that it's the word of the Lord. Hezekiah is proving that it's the word of the Lord. It's going to be healed. And when we see, you know, the signs of Jesus Christ coming, that was that there's probably the most prophecy about that of signs being given of the Christ being born. Um, that's how the, the wise men were able to travel when Jesus Christ was being born, because they were able to understand the scripture and understand the signs that were given to point to the birth of Jesus Christ. We also have signs of the second coming of Christ. You could turn to Matthew 24. And we're given these signs. We're told about them in advance. And the purpose is just so that we could know when we see the signs that these things are of God and that this is coming to pass. This is what the Bible says. Um, in verse number three of Matthew 24, it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation. And it goes on and on and on. And he, and he goes on to just explain that, well, you're going to see this happen. You're going to see this happen. You're going to see these events. You're going to see the sun, moon, and stars be dark, and you're going to see these things happen, and then know that the, the coming of the Son of Man is here, you know. So there are signs given to us already by God in Scripture in some events also as just a way for us to confirm and to know the word of the Lord. But we really don't need the signs. And in fact, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 16, if you want to flip back there, to the Pharisees, because the Pharisees sought a sign. Now, What's interesting about this is that Jesus was healing and Jesus was doing a lot of things that you could consider to be signs anyways. He was preaching the word of the Lord. He was healing people, was feeding people, was doing all the things that were already prophesied. So what in the world did they need another sign from Jesus when he's already fulfilling scripture as he's doing everything that he's doing? as he's doing things only the Son of God could do anyways. But he, he rebukes them. If you look at Matthew 16, verse number one, the Bible says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. So they're saying, no, no, this isn't good enough. I want you to show me that you're God and I want you to just show me a sign right now. This is the attitude they have. And this is the same attitude that a lot of unsaved people have. Well, if God's so real, then why doesn't he, you know, show up right here, right now and just tell me that he's real? You know, if he did that, then I'd believe, you know. And, and you hear, you know, these, these types of comments a lot. And this is basically the same attitude that the Pharisees and Sadducees had. Well, and just like when they mocked Jesus on the cross. Well, if you be the son of God, then why don't you come down from the cross right now, huh? Then we'll believe you. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And he's basically calling them wicked and saying, You're not going to get a sign. You should just believe what was already given to you. We don't need extra signs. You know, people in the Old Testament, before the whole Bible was even given, and when they are actually hearing from people saying, this is what the word of the Lord said. I could understand wanting to see a sign or know a sign that what they're saying is really coming from the Lord. But we're living in a time now where we have the word of the Lord. It's already been proven. It's already been tried and true. And we're not getting any more voices or commandments if someone's going around saying, thus saith the Lord, and they're saying things that are not found in Scripture, then we have already ascribed that person to be a false prophet. Because God's, God's not revealing His Word anymore. He's, he's done. He's given it. He's given us the revelation of the end times and has completed His words for us today. And, um, and we have what we need. Now turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. Because that's what Jesus said to them about seeking a sign. And he also warned in Matthew 24, where we were earlier, that there's going to be false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And at this point, I don't think that we should be looking for extra signs other than what's already been told to us in Scripture because... If we're looking to confirm, you know, the word of the Lord, other than what's already been given to us with extra signs, oh, well, is this the Christ? Is that the Christ? There's going to be false Christs that are going to give you signs and lying wonders, the Bible says, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. They're going to be very convincing in, sh in giving signs and doing their magic and, and, and doing things to try to convince people that they are the Son of God, that they are, you know, the, the next coming of Jesus Christ when the Antichrist comes into power. So, again, I think this is another reason, especially where we are today, to not be so interested in looking at and looking for specific signs 
in our life or whatever to confirm the word of the Lord. I think we should be able to just study the word of God and make decisions based on the word of God and be able to be content with that without having to look for extra signs outside our manifestations of some sort to, uh, to try to ascribe meaning to because we have all we need. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I love this passage because what this is explaining to us, this is the Apostle Peter saying that he was an eyewitness to the event when the glory of God was shining in the mountain and he heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He was an eyewitness to that. He heard it. He was there with Jesus Christ. And yet, being there, being in the moment, he's saying, you know what? We have a more sure word of prophecy. Even more important than me being there and seeing this and hearing this, we've got the Holy Scriptures. We've got the scriptures that have already been tried and true and have come down. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We have a very sure word, more sure than even just seeing and hearing with our ears. We have the word of God to, to, to make our foundation and to base our decisions on. And I understand having some doubts and, and, and wanting to make sure you're doing things right. I get it, but we need to be careful about looking to things to provide us assurance outside of God's word. Now, you may have situations where you can have multiple right choices to make. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to choose one. And there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way or a will for that matter as far as God's will is concerned. This is this understanding and this teaching has very much been a part of my own life. I, I think it has everyone different degrees. Personally for me, you know, when I, when I was deciding on where to pastor a church to begin with and even moving here and everything that kind of went along with that, uh, there's important decisions to be made and especially when they're life-changing decisions, Right? Even deciding to say, I'm going to pastor a church. That's a big decision to make. What am I going to do with my life? This is, this is a direction that I'm going to take. You know, it requires a lot of prayer and, and understanding and studying a scripture and saying, is this right? Well, I think it's pretty easy to see if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Is that the will of God to desire the office of a bishop? Sure it is. And if you meet the qualifications, if you meet what the Bible outlines as being there, then how could that not be the will of God to... to take on that type of a job. But then the next question is, and what I had to face, well, where? Where do you do this, right? I want to be in God's will. I want to know where he wants me. Well, the where of God's will, I don't think is nearly as important as the what of God's will. I'm not saying that God doesn't necessarily have a plan for you, but you can't, I don't think you can invest too much time just killing yourself over what to do when you're already knowing, hey, if I'm going to pastor a church somewhere, I think that's the will of God. If I were to pastor a church in a small town, in a big town, I think it's still, I could still be doing and in the will of God no matter where I am. I think I'd be doing a good thing, and I don't think we need to worry too much to the extent. Now, you could still use biblical principles and, and 
you know, what I ended up doing, especially when we moved here, was, well, where's the most people? Where's going to be the best impact? What's going to be the best thing? And at the end of the day, you kind of just let God deal with it. And I think instead of seeking a sign, one of the ways that I came to, to pray about things, especially areas where you may not be certain about something, I decided to just pray, say, God, I'm going to pray or I'm gonna, this is what I'm planning on doing, Lord. As far as I could tell, this is all according to your will. I don't think there's anything that I'm doing here that you don't want me to do. And this is what I'm planning on going forward with. I'm going to go here or I'm going to go to this church. If, the, if you really want me somewhere else, can you please just shut that door for me and just make sure that that's just not a possibility? It's not seeking a sign. It's just, you know, I, I'm intending on doing this. And, I, you know, if you really don't want to do anything against the will of God, just, just make that unavailable. Make that option not there because God's capable of doing that if he really wants to. But even that, you know, you, know, you don't want to, I, I don't think, I don't think it's wise to get, just start looking for a lot of uh, meaning because you could misinterpret things. It's kind of like when, when uh, someone's going through a hard time in their life, one person might look at that person and say, oh, that's a result of their sin. Right? And that may or may not be true. It could just be the result of someone doing something wicked to that person because of their sin. Right? It could be, you know, something else. God's trying. I mean, I mean there, there, there's so many different things, real causes for things that we don't always know the answer to. And when you start ascribing too much meaning or thinking you know the meaning behind everything, you, you want to be careful with that. And especially when it comes to um, making important decisions, right? On a, on a regular day-to-day -day basis, it's, not, it's, it's really not that big of a deal if you say that, well, God let me make all the green lights in order to get to work on time or something like that. There, there's, not, there's not really much of a, of a concern either way on, on, on a thought like that. It's not a big deal. But when you're starting to make some very serious decisions, you just want to be careful that, that you're looking more and weighing more on what is the will of the Lord than you are on just some superficial circumstance and ascribing extra meaning to that, if that all makes sense. Last place I return is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. At the end of the day, God has given us a lot of freedom. God is a God of liberty. He gives us a lot of choices. He gives us this life to, to really to do as we will. He wants us to look to him. He wants us to do things according to his will. But he gives us a lot of freedom. When you're looking for a job, I don't think there's just only one job that you can have that would be the will of God. There's a lot of jobs you could choose from. When people are looking for a spouse, I don't think there's just one person out there for you. I don't believe in that, that there's just only one person that is the right person for you to marry. And if you miss that person, you've screwed up your whole life. You can never really find the right person to get married to ever again. I think there are choices and that there are a number of people that you can choose that would still work out and be in God's will if that's what you choose because God's given you that ability. I don't think it has to boil down to any one particular person or job or place to live or you know think of other what other major event that you might be considering in your life uh, even even coming here you know i think it's a will of the lord coming here but i think i very easily could have been doing the will of the lord and getting a lot of people saved and god would have been blessing if we chose another area to to, to move to just me personally somewhere else and doing a great work now, I'm glad we're here. I think God helped lead us here. But at the same time, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you could still do a great work. And then someone else could be led here of the Lord. Just how things work out. And uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 2, the Bible says, For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, the reason why I had you turn here is because we know what the will of the Lord is. There's many, this is just one example in scripture. It says there in verse three, for this is the will of God. 
There's plenty of examples where the Bible says, this is the will of God. This is God's will. This is what God wants from you. And every time what you're going to find out is that they're very basic truths. It's not individualized to, um, you know, one specific person. It's, it's generalized of, hey, this is what God wants you to do. And if you're, if you're meeting these basic truths, if you're following these principles, if you're following God's commandments, if you're doing these things, then everything's going to be fine. You don't need to, to get too concerned over all of the little details, as it were, of trying to figure out, you know, and, and look for things that aren't there. And just know that God's given us freedom and liberty, and I thank God for that, where, whereby we can know what's right and what's not right. So, so try not to get caught up in, in kind of the mysticism in, in understanding God's word or God's will for your life. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and, if you, and I would recommend when you make important decisions in your life, rely on prayer, fasting, and counsel to, to try to help you make a good choice and then move forward from there. You know, you don't need to doubt your, your decisions. Once you've gone a certain direction, you know, keep going. Espe you know, especially, like I said, you could be in the will of God in many capacities and be doing the right thing. And we don't need to be looking for anything outside of Scripture for that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us from your words. Lord, I pray that you please just help us to have understanding and just um, know what the will of the Lord is by reading our Bibles, by studying it, by praying, and uh, that you would just illuminate our path before us. You don't always tell us how or, or show us our entire path before us, but you give us what we need to know to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, Lord. And I pray that you would please just help us to have the faith in your words that um, we can make decisions and not be scared about what the future is going to hold, but just make the right decisions according to the day and not have to look for other um, confirmation of your words outside of just what your word says. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.